Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so welcome to the day two of the Mobile Intelligence Conference. My name is Susie Kim Riley, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Acuto. We're based in Boston, and our mission is to make mobile internet connectivity more accessible through data sponsorships, also known as sponsored data and data rewards. I'll be your MC for the following three panels. Today we're going to focus on the connected consumer. We have three great panels lined up to discuss topics ranging from video, mobile marketing, advertising, and commerce. With the onslaught of mobile content and innovative new services, users globally are spending more time than ever on mobile. According to eMarketer, in the US, consumers spend an average of over three hours per day on mobile, two hours on PCs, and four hours on TV to consume content. In Brazil, consumers spend almost four hours per day, even more than in the US. Marketers from all segments are turning to mobile to engage with users. The mobile advertising market a few years ago was in the tens of billions worldwide, is now a hundred billion dollar business. And you've all heard that traditional forms of advertising doesn't work on mobile. It's true, throwing a banner in the middle of some content where half the clicks are actually mistakes doesn't work for consumers nor marketers. Many brands are now turning to mobile video advertising to engage consumers, but video ads are notorious for chewing up your data plan. According to an article published by the New York Times earlier in the year, the average consumer spends up to 950 per month of their data plan on video ads, and as a result, ad blocking on mobile is on the rise. In the US and other developed countries, improvements brought on by LTE has been a game changer and carriers have rolled out well-sized data plans. And even some offer pseudo unlimited data plans. But people still run out and, the, and they scavenge for Wi-Fi hotspots. In most of Asia, Latin America, and even parts of Europe, more than half of smartphone users do not have cellular data connectivity. Given the challenges of content, consumption, and engagement on the mobile platform, what can marketers do to ensure a positive user experience? We have speakers from across the ecosystem, social platforms, content providers, mobile marketing and ad tech companies, mobile commerce providers and consultants. We'll be hearing from well-established players like Facebook, Microsoft, Visa, PBS, Danal, and iConnective to relative newcomers like Ad Colony, now a part of Opera, Keep and Acuto about the new approaches they are taking to engage users on mobile. You'll also be hearing about the increasing importance of clever partnerships in the ecosystem and how they have brought forth innovations uniquely enabled by the mobile experience. The panels are moderated by two distinguished writers and reporters from eWeek and TechCrunch. Todd Weiss, senior writer of eWeek, is an award-winning technology journalist who has been covering enterprise IT for more than 16 years. He's a senior writer for eWeek.com, covering all things mobile, from smartphones to tablets to notebooks, apps, IoT, and more. He has previously been a staff reporter and a journalist for various publications, including Computer World. Jay Donovan has been with TechCrunch since 2009, covering emerging technologies and startup companies. Jay is also an associate director of strategy at Resource Emirati, an IBM company that specializes in digital marketing and creative creative agency services for IBM's large retail and CPG clients. Both are frequent speakers at various industry events. Please welcome the first panel moderated by Todd Weiss. The speakers on the panel are Brian Buskas, Chief Customer Officer at Ad Colony, Paul Peterman, U.S. Head of Industry and Global Marketing Solutions at Facebook, Hilary Batzel, Markham Marcom Media Director for, Con for Consumer Brands with Microsoft, Ira Rubenstein, SVP and General Manager of Digital and Marketing at PBS. Hello, and thanks for coming to our uh, panel discussion today. I'm Todd Weiss from eWeek. I'll just, how about we introduce every panelist real quickly so everybody knows who you are, and then we'll jump in. Sure. Hi, I'm Hilary Batzel from Microsoft. Uh, I'm Paul Peterman from Facebook. Brian Buskus from uh, Ag Colony and Opera Media Works. 
Ira Rubenstein from PBS. Excellent. Well, we're going to get underway quickly because we have a limited time. Um, so what we, this panel is going to talk about today is the mobile advertising sphere. So what the first question, panelists, is how is mobile advertising working today? Uh, do you see successes? What are the benefits for users and advertisers? Can you share your experiences and insights? We talked a little bit about this on our call before. Hillary, you want to start? Sure. Um, mobile advertising is really important because it's where consumers are spending their time, right? And it's all about what are consumers doing. So I think about the average right now is four hours a day uh, consumers are spending on mobile, and about 25% of that time is spent with mobile video. Okay. So as an advertiser, for success, we need to be reaching you where you are consuming video. And uh, Microsoft spends about 50% of their ad budget on video. And you won't see us walk away from television, but you'll slowly see us moving into a world where video is cross-screen, right? And we need to be out there not only in linear television, but in social online video, in pre-roll, in um, you know, Hulus of the worlds and whatnot, as well as other mobile opportunities. Okay. Uh, you know, I think that Hillary talked about it. Like, it's all about being where the people are. And for many years in this industry, we heard about the fact that the year of mobile was coming. And where, where we sit right now is that the year of mobile has already happened. So today what we see are brands that are working to find the best ways to engage people where they're spending their time. On Facebook specifically, we see a billion people using Facebook through a mobile device each day, over 100 million video views a day as well. So uh, when we look at where people are spending their time, it's a no-brainer that you know, they're going to be spending their time uh, on, on mobile. And then I do think that what we've seen, the shift that we've seen for marketers and for uh, executives and, and that, that I speak to in the industry is that they're trying to figure out a way how to, ex to accelerate their adoption and to really drive business results through their use of mobile advertising. Okay. Yeah, I would just build on what Hillary said in terms of video. Um, mobile video advertising has been what's fueling. It's been the fastest growing segment of all of advertising over the last few years. It's still really driving mobile advertising forward. And I think it's also been blurring the line between even rich media and video. So on mobile, you know, the nature of the device, your location, the data that's around that, you can serve you know, not just a branding message, a one-way message, but really something that, that's interactive, that encourages engagement from the consumer. And I think you're, you're able to replicate that TV experience on mobile, but adding the engagement component is what's so powerful. Um, you know, having worked on that solely focused on in-app mobile video, I think if you want to talk about in-app time spent versus mobile web, right? Five years ago it was all mobile web. Today, the majority is in-app. And if you think about in-app, the technology that's there today are, are for really great kind of mobile video experiences. That's great for end users. It's great for marketers. Um, but it's really around driving engagement and driving results that's much more measurable than a lot of the other kind of uh, formats that are out there. Okay. Ira, what do you think about so, that? So um, for us at PBS, um, uh, you might be surprised that our audience actually is mobile. Um, I know when people think of PBS, they think of their parents, um, but we're more <laughs> than that. And um, in fact, if you look at our traffic numbers, uh, a show like uh, PBS NewsHour, which um, probably scales older than most, um, over half their traffic is on mobile platforms, which isn't really that surprising. And they're quickly growing uh, content to platforms like Facebook and um, Twitter and elsewhere. But in terms of as an advertiser and we're trying to get people to tune in or to consume content on one of our other digital platforms, be that OTT or app, et cetera, mobile is a critical part of that advertising. And we're looking at how you create compelling creative for that in a world that you might be hearing a lot of buzzword called vertical video, which is really kind of taking off, meaning that People hold their phone up vertically, and when you want, when you create ads in a kind of a video environment in your TV, you're more horizontal. And so the trick is create compelling creative for that video format in a vertical format instead of the kind of panoramic or, or horizontal one. Okay. We also had talked about uh, problems, things that aren't working necessarily with mobile data, things like customers, users who are using their data plans, and they have data plans that might not have a lot of capacity. So that's a pressure. You have a, a, a plan that doesn't have a lot of capacity, 
um, so you may not consume this video, which the advertisers want you to consume, the companies want you to consume. Can you talk a little bit about how that works when the video isn't working, when that part of, is, is a struggle for a company? I think you should actually start. You're doing some great things there. Sure, yeah. I mean, um, five years ago, we kind of set out on this challenge. Um, you know, Ad Colony was historically an app developer and built lots of apps for video-rich companies like ESPN, CBS, other entertainment brands in Los Angeles. And the one challenge was around video. How do you deliver a great video experience on mobile? Um, and the one thing we saw is that 90% plus of the devices we see every day, um, 1.4 billion mobile devices across Opera MediaWorks, 90% of them connect to Wi-Fi at some point during mm. the day. So we invented a technology, we called it Instant Play. So basically, you're able to deliver that video ad right before the user's gonna view it. You could deliver it even on Wi-Fi and it could play back five minutes later, you know, when they're on a cellular connection and actually use no data. So that downloads to their, to their phone or device? Temporarily, okay. yeah. It could download to their device, it could play back. You could still have user choice for where you opt in or if you take engagement on that ad to watch more video, you know, on YouTube or drive you to a landing page. The other piece was really around rewarded video. So having the consumer choice to consume uh, a mobile video advertisement or message, right? So um, today we've seen that, originally it started in games, it became really popular in games. Today you see it in, in content, premium publishing, where the users say, hey, you wanna read this full story? You know, watch, uh, watch an ad, or you could subscribe, right? But most consumers say, okay, I wanna see this one story, you know, I know it's, it's a value exchange, I'll watch this one ad, but they're getting something really valuable. Um, which could be content, it could be, you know, items in a game. Um, so they're actually more receptive, and we've seen that for the user, that drives just much richer engagement. Okay. When the message isn't one way, it's a two-way uh, uh, message with, with room for engagement. Paul, you have some thoughts, I see. <laughs> uh, a couple, you know, I think we, we spend at Facebook a lot of time thinking about the experiences of, of people, because at the end of the day, uh, we learn from people and we build our services to, to help people. Um, and when we think about the connectivity and the data issues that are outside of the US especially, uh, we want to be able to build for those situations. So for example, we have this thing called uh, 2G Tuesdays at Facebook where you can actually uh, be on a 2G connection and so our engineers can actually think and live in the experiences for the people that they're building. So it's one thing that's actually a specific product that we have is this thing called Slideshow. And it allows you, as a marketer, to take a video that you have, it'll pick out certain frames in a video and create a richer experience than just a photo, but something that is a little bit more data friendly. So it kind of creates a slideshow experience for, and that's, I think, gonna be something that's gonna be very popular outside the US. If we think about the US specifically, data consumption isn't quite as much of a concern. We were talking about that this morning, that a lot of people leave data on the table. But what is really important is to think about how people are, you talked about vertical video, how people are actually consuming on that screen. So taking your TV ad and running a 60 second ad in the mobile environment maybe isn't the best way to do it. And I think that what we're focused on is helping people create what we call thumb stopping content because your thumb is really the one that's scrolling and it's in charge. So if you have content that your thumb will stop on and view, it doesn't necessarily have to be 60 seconds for you to get impact. We did a, a meta-analysis across 170 campaigns with Nielsen, found that 74% of brand impact happens within the first 10 seconds of a video view. So if you think about that, and you think about the data consumption there versus a traditional 30 or 60 second ad, there's different ways to think about uh, effectiveness in the mobile environment, and that's what we're really focused on. Yeah, I think one of the biggest hindrances is actually consumer attention. The average attention span is seven seconds. So to get to that 10 is really good. <laughs> yeah. um, and that makes it hard as a content provider of how do you really have a compelling offering within the first you know, five seconds of someone seeing your message. And when you talk about thumb stalking content, you have to design for each platform. So Facebook and designing for Facebook are, is very different than designing for Instagram and the content you're putting out there. Um, some of the things we've done is, you know, we have put our 60 second ads, you know, in, in that space and there's right times to do that and there's right times not to do that. There's also sound, you know, issues of if sound is really compelling to your message, what kind of overlays do you need to put within that five seconds to have an action, you know, be taken? So to Brian's point, it's not just about 
the content, it's about the action and the engagement with that. And you have to think about that, I think, a little differently in the mobile space when you're designing content and getting your messages out there, because it's not just about the video view. And so then, back, it's, back and to then your it's question, quite, though, about the data consumption, I think that's a short-term problem. Because I think Wi-Fi is getting more ubiquitous, and I think people are getting on or hip to the fact, what's the, you know, first time we walked in back there, what's the Wi-Fi code? <laughs> And you know, people want that because it's faster, it's better, it's more reliable. So I, I think it's a short-term problem, actually. Okay. And I think eventually it's not going to be an issue. I think if you're producing good content, too, it becomes less of an issue. If it's something people really want, then That's they're right. going to watch it, regardless of what data it's going to you know, use. Then there's a yeah. dynamic. It's constantly changing. So what works today may not work next week. So how do you stay abreast of what you do next week or next month? How do you monitor how it's changing as, as this happens? It's all trial and error. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of tests. Like you are going to have some hits and you're going to have some misses, and you learn from it and you keep evolving, and you you go on a run where you feel really good about what you're doing, and then you realize you have to change. You know, one of the biggest learnings from a Microsoft perspective is we we do a lot of very professionally produced content, and in say Snapchat or Facebook Live Stories. It's, it's live. You don't need professional content for that. You want to be part of the natural integration of why consumers are there. And so that, that's actually a learning. We came of, you know, we ran something. It was a little bit, it didn't fit with the environment that you were in. So you learn from that and you move on. Okay. One of the things I think that we're seeing brands like Microsoft do that believe in testing and learning and iterating is you, you also have to know when to put your foot on the gas. So yeah. if you find, because things will evolve. And if you're in a perpetual state of testing, uh, you're never going to reap the benefits. Um, you know, we saw one, one example I'll give is, is a campaign that Garmin did with us to launch their a new smartwatch that they were, had coming out, the, the Phoenix 3 Sapphire smartwatch. And uh, they looked at Instagram and Facebook a little bit differently. They said, hey, we want to go ahead and create engaging videos to drive awareness of the smartwatch on Instagram. And then we're going to use, uh, we're going to be able to retarget people who view those videos with a Facebook carousel ad that is going to be further down the funnel. Then we're also going to take those groups of people that seem to be uh, viewing this content and very interested and actually create lookalike targeting clusters uh, for, those for those people as well, yada, yada, down the line. And what they actually wound up doing was for a campaign where they had a goal of a 2x return on ad spend, they had a 9.7x return on ad spend. As, as measured by, by the conversion pixel that they had. The story of, the reason I bring that up is because they were able to not only have a plan going in, but then to iterate as they went, and were able to drive really strong results. The danger of that is you see nine time return on investment, and you want to do it again. Yeah. So how do you know whether to do that again, or now what do you move to? And now if it's only a two times return, is that a disappointment because it wasn't a nine? How do you, how do you deal with that? Well, I think, look, Content is very important here because we talked about if, if the content's relevant to somebody and you're targeting the right people with it, the, your, your advertising message is actually going to be additive to the experience. So continuing to use data and insights to figure out who you want to get this message in front of and to even create that message as well is very important. The other thing is that it is the ecosystems are evolving, and you, so you have a company like Facebook and Instagram. Um, which make up about 20% of all the time spent that people are, are spending on their mobile devices, we are constantly enhancing and coming out with new products that are in response to what people want to, to use. So I think if you're staying out front with the most innovative platforms, um, not just Facebook and Instagram, but other platforms out there, you're going to be, uh, and, and you're staying focused on the business results, I think that you can win. Okay. Brian, did you want to Yeah, add no, I think... Um, I work with a lot of performance marketers around the world. If you look at app developers, right, who are trying to drive app downloads. If What's you look, a performance marketer? Someone who's, who's really kind of focused on return on ad spend. Okay. So they can track an actual purchase back to a view, to a click, and the whole funnel, right? And the exciting, having been a marketer you know, myself and come from that world, um, it's exciting to see how big company marketing has gone from being just an expense on the balance sheet to actually a growth center. Yeah. So, you know, you see these mobile developers who have created some of them, you know, 50 plus person teams who live and eat and breathe data and, and tracking and, and reaching, you know, millions of consumers every few minutes on mobile, on TV, all around the world. But they're able to track that to actual purchase, purchases and show, you know, a 30 day return on investment of that ad spend. So, 
that to me is really exciting, and it's solved you know, some of these challenges. We're, we're starting to see a lot more brands get a lot more kind of DR focused uh, with mobile and how you can work there, but it's really unlocking a lot of dollars for mobile. Um, it's, it's, I mean, that, that's the, I don't want to say easy marketing, but it is the easier marketing. When I was at Marvel running digital and doing digital comics, I had a complete ROI. I knew what it took to sign someone up to sign up for his monthly subscription. I could just run numbers all day. It's harder when I was in film and TV. You don't control who buys a ticket. And in TV, the tracking data on what you're watching is in its infancy right now. But it's coming. I don't mean to scare people. But yeah, we know what you're watching. And you're now starting to tie it in everywhere. And as that matures, TV advertisers will start getting more sophisticated. I know how much it costs me to get that view. Yeah. Ira, isn't it even more unique a situation for PBS because you're not a traditional ad-based network? Yeah. I mean, how does that work? We, we sort of talked about that on the phone the other day. Um, but how does that work? How does, does PBS have a different approach than, say, a traditional uh, uh, media company, whether it's television or radio or online? Yeah, we, um, we take a much different approach. We're, we're much more interested in overall engagement of the American public as part of our mission. And we're much more interested in diverse programming for everyone across topics. If we were interested in just ratings, you would see Downton Abbey drama seven nights a week, and you don't. You get great shows <laughs> like, sure. you know, Nova and Nature and Frontline and uh, we have a great show for Hamilton coming in the fall, the making of, arts and entertainment's important. But we're starting to look at, okay, ratings mean something, but Frontline cuts a video specifically for Facebook, specifically as we're talking about thumb stopping, and uh, it was on the uh, Syria crisis. And that, it was, I'm ready to, well that was one, and another one was ISIS camp, but five million views, well that counts for something. Sure. And so we're interested in how many people in America we can get to engage with this content. Eventually, the other part of the equation is, does that help people then become a supporter of their local station? Because believe it or not, it isn't the government writing us a check. The government writes a check to Corporation Public Broadcasting, who in turn supports local stations. And those local station pays due to PBS. So we're very interested in helping people connect with their local stations, becoming a viewer, viewers like you, half of a station's budget is that. And so by compelling content, does that get them to then actually support that station? I'm also curious, PBS, are you ahead of the curve compared to say traditional media companies and, and <laughs> things like that? Or sort of behind them because you're waiting to see what they're gonna do and see if it works for PBS? i say we're in the middle right now. Okay. I wouldn't say we're lagging, and I wouldn't say we're leading. Um, I obviously would love to go faster, but we have some, we're, look, we're on every compelling platform. We're on Roku, we're on all these platforms, we're there early. Um, we have mobile apps and, and everything like that. We enabled the local station to do that. We just launched um, for each station a, uh, um, a membership video on demand service. So if you're a member of your local station, you can get access to a library of content. You want to compare that to HBO Go and CBS? Sure, but that's not really what it is. It's more of a membership benefit. So in terms of those kind of forward thinking, I think we're right in the middle. And me personally, I'd like to be leading even more. Um, that's just my nature. But I feel like we're doing a good job given our limits and budgets. And more importantly, we're serving the American public on platforms they expect to be at in a compelling, consumer-friendly way, just as any other media company. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next question. Uh, some companies, this is really interesting. Uh, it's about sponsored data. Some companies are now offering perks to users, such as free data for consuming online ads or other attractions. How are companies addressing the reluctance of many consumers to view online ads because they will be using their own data package um, and the whole issue is avoiding overages. You know, that's T-Mobile's big thing, avoiding overages. So the whole concept of what are companies doing right now to, to bring more people in by sort of offering them perks, free data, other kinds of things I'm hearing about that will attract them to say, oh, I should watch this video content because now I can afford to. What do you think about that? I, th I think, you know, from a brand messaging perspective, it goes back to if you have compelling content and a consumer wants to view it, that will become 
a non-issue, sure. right? So if there are opportunities where you can add that additional incremental value to them, then sure, take advantage. So what was it, five years ago where it was all value exchange for Wi-Fi at airports? Everyone still loves that. It's right. free, you watch a video, you get your access, you have your downtime you know, before your plane flight. I think for mobile, you know, the stuff that Brian and, and Ad Colony and Opera are doing is, uh, as an Aikido is very interesting on offering that up. Um, from an advertising perspective, I'd say it is, uh, you have to find the right moment to give that value exchange. I think ESPN um, and MediaBricks are two companies that are doing some interesting value exchanges of just trying to be smarter about where we serve messages. Okay. So while it's not a data play, if I am mid-game and I just lost and I'm really upset because I didn't get to this level, I probably don't want a message about how you should go out and be happy and change the world, right? You know, you, you want something that's going to play off that mood. And so kind of giving you that opportu opportunity to serve mood-based video. And so if ESPN, if your team, right, lost or you had this great victory, you want something that's going to tie into your uplifting mood. So that is a different kind of value exchange that I know that we're tapping into, okay. but not necessarily the data exchange, because I think the opportunities from an advertiser are fairly limited right now. Okay. Yeah, and, and look, I think that there certainly are situations where it makes sense. I think the Wi-Fi in the airport is a good example of where it makes sense. But I think as an industry, we need to be thinking bigger. We need to be thinking about that we, the consumer experience and how are we delighting consumers. In some cases, that might be an example of delighting consumers. But we believe that the best way is to put the right message in front of the right person and make the advertising experience additive to what people are doing. So there's lots of different ways to go at it, but I think if you're doing that and you're providing real value to people, um, I don't really see a lot of people complaining about advertising that is uh, relevant to them. And if, if they're in, in the market for a new cable provider or for a new phone provider or something like that or a new device, they, they want to see the, those messages. So I think find, being able to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time is something that we're very passionate about. How, do you, how are you doing that at Facebook right now? Do you have any examples that you can share about what you're doing or how you're doing it? How do you target someone at a specific time and you know that's the right time? And, and I want to be careful when we talk about time. I'll, t I'll take a shot at that. But when we talk about time, it's not really about like right that second. But in general, um, I, I think that the way that we're doing it is understanding um, so a partner like Microsoft could understand where their customers are in a certain part of their life cycle with maybe they have an Xbox and they've played the last three Halos, but for some reason they're not playing the most recent version. So they can actually um, upload audiences into our, uh, into our system in a privacy safe way and they can actually reach those people and put a message in front of them that may be saying, hey, did you know that um, Halo is uh, available for you right today? Hmm. Um, so there are ways that you can do that. And then the second thing is the whole mission of Facebook's newsfeed. Uh, and we just had the 10th anniversary of newsfeed. And it's hard to imagine that Facebook existed before we had feed, uh, but it did. Uh, but the whole mission behind newsfeed is, is giving you a most, the most relevant uh, feed for you. So your feed probably looks a lot different than mine. I know there's lots of talk about politics today and, and how people's feeds are different. But that's just the nature of the newsfeed. They're kind of, it's kind of like snowflakes. Okay, Brian, do you have any thoughts about this? Nothing about snowflakes, but uh, <laughs> to build off that. But um, you know, going back to, to value exchange, like um, when we pioneered value exchange and tested with all these mobile developers, we saw that yes, users would, if you gave them the choice to watch content in exchange mm -hmm. for premium content or um, some sort of reward, and then you take that away, they actually complain. <laughs> they will go and write reviews to Apple and you know blogs and get on Reddit and say. Like, why don't I have this opportunity anymore? Like, I don't want to pay for the full monthly subscription for this content. I just want to read this story, or I just want to, you know, have a choice, chance to to earn or progress or whatever that is. And that was a really kind of interesting key learning. And then, so that's on the video piece. But if you talk about on engagement, if you look at the number one engagement, a user who who opts in and watches a video, let's say it's you know eight to ten seconds, fifteen seconds on mobile, um, the number one action they take is to watch more video. And that's their choice. You know, if they're going to YouTube to watch, you know, full-length trailers. They're going to other sites to watch uh, it's just more content. Um, but the, the second kind of action up there is really around downloading an app. And if you hear, say, um, on a cellular connection, and you know, today there's partners like Akuto and Suzy who spoke a, a moment ago, who are able to, you know, partner with the carriers 
to say, okay, we know you're on a cellular connection, we know you're a Verizon or, or an AT&T customer, this app is 50 megs, we can rebate you, we can put 50 megs back onto your data plan. And to a consumer, that's pretty exciting, that's right. pretty compelling. It's giving them the opportunity to consume content where you know, at that moment, previously in the past, maybe they would have chosen not to download right. that. Yeah. Okay. I, think, I think sometimes, I know data is a concern, but if you're in a game and you wanna get to the next level, those coins or that you know, monetary value as part of that experience actually sometimes is more of value than maybe your data usage. So it, when you talk about the experiences, it's really where is the mindset of the consumer and what do they want as part of that value exchange right. And there. what do you give them back? Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right, Ira, did you have anything? No. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to talk about next is examples of mobile ads. When we talked on the phone, all of us, we talked about examples of things that were successful, examples of things that could give concrete evidence of, oh, this is the kind of thing you can do. Um, and so I wanted to see, can we talk about some of the success stories of brands and ads that would help drive mobile advertisers to have more success? We had talked about one of the things was, uh, I, I was mentioning, and it's not really a mobile video ad, but we could it, just throw it out there. During the Olympics, you all saw those Tide ads, the Tide Moms, which I thought was incredible content. You don't hear about the Tide products. You don't hear about any of that. It's just about content that's aimed at the, you watch, at the viewers that I thought was really successful. And we talked about a little bit about, are those the kinds of things? It's not necessarily the message, but it's exactly the kind of, I guess it is the message. What you want to tell people, what you want to share with them. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm going to jump into that because um, at Microsoft, we have, yes, all of our campaigns to drive consumer brand adoption, right? I want to sell you surfaces. I want you to get out and love my Windows products. But there's also these great things that are happening that Microsoft technology is enable, enabling everyone in this audience to do. And so we have a balance of those messages that we're putting out there, which a lot of them are similar to the Tide, where it's this great compelling story of a person who has gone and through using technology has changed the way or the, the category can use. An example of that was one um, that we called Growing Underground. It was a London two-man team. They basically took old London bunkers and instead of them being wasted space underneath the city, turned them into a cultivation for food. Wow. And so they now distribute that food to people that didn't have that opportunity um, in the London area. And it's not a story about Microsoft, but it's presented by Microsoft, which makes that connection, the emotional connection for users. Correct, and, and those stories are just, they're very powerful and you should right. get them out there. To go back to your question of like, how do you get that out there and get people to take notice? That was a very visual story. And so actually we partnered with Instagram and pushed it out with these beautiful, compelling images but we needed people to engage in the video, not just through the image. So you ha we had a call to action, right, of here's what you're actually seeing. Imagine this being underground. Wow. And you, know, you need to tie that together. So um, we, lo we love the brand stuff that people are doing because it's about the person. You know, I think we've all talked about it's where the consumer, are, consumer is viewing, it's what the consumer is doing, and the messages about our companies and how we're succeeding is actually how you are succeeding through the use of our technology. Yeah, that's great. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, we talked about kind of the length of creative. I think, um, you know, one thing, last year we put forth um, multi-million dollars to work with creative agencies around mobile-first creative, so not taking television creative to, to mobile. And there were a lot of learnings around length. What's the optimal length for, for mobile? And the answer is kind of different based on the different yeah. placements. If you're in a feed or if you're in, you know, a standard pre-roll in front of other video content, uh, but the trend is definitely like shorter, more kind of engaging. And, and like 20 kind of, seconds, 30 seconds? Or we're talking like six to eight seconds. Really? And, um, you know, really, really kind of shorter um, content. What can, what can you say in six to eight seconds? Thank well, you. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. It's really tough. The question is, you know, how do you, how do you get that second of the moment, the consumer's time, to allow for a deeper engagement, yeah. to allow for to watching the 30 second, you know, spot that maybe you want the content. Um, but, you know, on mobile, you ask for specific examples. I think um, in travel, there's a lot of stuff we've done around um, with guys like Hilton around um, 360 video. So you can actually drop a user into a physical location at a hotel in the Bahamas and let them look around and experience and the that, hotel. And that adds a whole other dimension, the whole 360 video. Yeah. Or you talk about automotive um, and work we've done with, with Toyota and Lexus around haptics. So having vibration and actually sensory 
um, around feeling this car, you know, go around the corners or, or, or how it handles. So there's, there's exciting things on mobile that people are pushing the limit um, with video, with rich media, and, and just the capabilities. To Toyota's a great example. Did anyone see that video of a blind gentleman who was helped by a harness that they made that wrapped around his neck and helped him have the ability to be able to feel things. It had sensors in it so that when he would walk around, it would tell him if he was about to walk into something or what was around with GPS and things like that. It wasn't about the cars. It was about Toyota research. And again, that's that kind of mobile connection that you can make with your, your viewers. Yeah. And I was going to say, the other thing you can do with mobile um, that w I've done in the past, and I think I even did it with Ad Colony back when I was at Fox, um, and when I was at Fox, it was doing these mobile ads that knew where you were, and so that it could then pull up a database, say, okay, your movie showtime is at this local theater that's five feet away from you, and the time, and you could click the ticket. And what we're doing now at PBS um, with Tremor is that it'll know what city you're in. And so then when, it, when I have the, the ad go about, you know, tune in to watch whatever Ken Burns film or something, it will say, tune in to Las Vegas PBS or KQED or what have you. So it's personalizing that campaign to the call to action for their local station with their local showtime. And that is something that is working really well on mobile when you can add that local locality factor to your campaign. And I'll add to what Brian was mentioning. Like this is, this is really in its infancy right now. We think about, Cisco came out with a study the other day that said that 75% of all mobile traffic by 2020 will be video. That's a big statement. Um, and, and right now, there are studies out there that suggest that around 45 to 50% of all video globally is consumed on mobile devices. So when things like 360 video are very exciting, um, we've worked, uh, we build out at Facebook something called the Facebook Canvas. And actually, Microsoft's been a great adopter of this. And a number of partners have as well, where it's, it's, a, it's an easy to build immersive experience that happens right there on your phone, right there in newsfeed. You can launch into it. You can, you can tilt and pan in a 360 type way right there in, in the experience. You can, you can learn about different products and, and maybe stories that brands are trying to tell. And at the end, there's a call to action. And you can actually start to measure the business value you're getting, getting from that experience. All right. You talk about mobile video. You, know, you want to look at the future. Any of you have any kids who are under 15, I guarantee you they're watching everything on their phone or their tablet. At PBS, we know 80% of our kids' video traffic is mobile, that being tablet or phone. 80%. That's wow, today. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. I want to get to our last question and still have a few minutes for a couple of questions. Uh, the last question we had talked about was the success of online ads is about content that grabs users and brings them back and causes videos to take off. How do you address this and ensure that your ads will be the next hits? That's kind of a, a big question. How do you do that? It's this in the first six seconds, something big, and you don't do any sort of credit logo or anything, and you have uh, some sort of big text graphic because there's no sound. Yep. And it's you know quick and fast, and that's your best shot. Yeah, I think, I think it comes down to the consumer journey is so different than it was in the past. Uh, you can't expect that your first touch point is going to be a television ad. Your first touch point could very much be a Snapchat video. It could be a Instagram post. And you have to develop content for each of the platforms. And while that takes a lot of work, that work pays off because that, that could be your first engagement with consumer and it needs to be an impactful one. And so in mobile video, it is that six seconds. You know, how do you get that compelling message, which is a different experience than a sit back experience of watching a television program, right? Six seconds. I keep yeah. coming back to six seconds. But, but, but consumers are savvy. Like that six seconds, if you're, if your goal doesn't have to be a video view. We did this great campaign around um, STEM and getting young females involved in STEM. And the whole content was around uh, these young females who didn't know who female inventors were, right? They were asked the question, name inventors, they were all male. And it was, well, name a female inventor. Nobody can do it, and so it was raising awareness. That was a very long message, but in six seconds, we had the highest share rate of that video because people got it. Huh. And so consumers are really savvy, and if it's something that they're compelled to, that six seconds can be a really big moment. But it, to your point earlier, it's hard. My yeah. girlfriend asked me to write something in 400 words. I told her I couldn't write my name in 400 words. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, yeah. 
Uh, that's an occupational hazard for you, I think. <laughs> uh, the, uh, look, I, I also want to make sure that people understand that it's not that people are only viewing videos for three seconds or six seconds, but it is bring, bringing your brand and your message up front to the front of the video is something that is a little bit different. Because traditionally, people have been building TV ads where there's a punchline at the end in the last two seconds. And you kind of want to flip it. It's more of an inverted pyramid yeah. approach. Uh, so I think that that's really important. And the other thing is, you could put up a bunch of funny cat videos and you could probably get a lot more views maybe than what you're getting with some of the other videos that you put out. But at the end of the day, you have to be measuring the business impact. And that's how you're going to know if it's effective. That's how we know in our partnership with Nielsen that I mentioned earlier, we know the brand impact that happens in the first 10 seconds. Well, guess what? If someone watches it 20 seconds and 30 seconds, the impact continues to rise. Sure. Uh, the only point is that you get a lot more impact than I think we ever really thought in the first 10 seconds of spending time, and consumers' attention is, is fragmented. It's that capture, yeah. Yeah. capture them. Brian, did you have something you thought? Yeah, no, um, you know, we talked about the length, and so, you know, kind of the, the snackability of that content, but also creating, you know, thumb-stopping moments, like, mm -hmm. that can live in a feed. And I think, um, you know, those are, those are key pieces, but if you look at other deeper, richer things, if you look at, say, like, um, you know, it's about, on mobile, the biggest feature is really the shareability. So every everything is one tap away from sharing and disseminating this to you know millions of people potentially, right? Whether that's through Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat. You know, if you look at what Snapchat's done with with kind of filters and lenses and kind of branded content, you know, that's it's not really an ad, but it's it's branded content that is is fun and people share it. Like it, it can become much more viral, you know, and attached to a brand or attached to something. Okay. Um, but creating, you know, viral success is really, is really a challenge, you know. People have, online, uh, you know, marketers have been talking about this for, you know, years, the last, you know, decade or so. Okay. But, um, you know, if you keep those things in mind, I think, and, and you keep kind of the mobile first lens, you know, whether it's video, whether it's just, let's just say mobile advertising, I think you can, you can leverage a lot of these things to come up with something that is, that breakthrough creates those some stopping moments, but it's also possibly shareable. Right, and helpful great. and something somebody would want to share. Thank you. Ira, did you have anything? I, I want to get to questions. We don't have no, a lot you can of get to questions. Is that all right? All right. Uh, thanks, for all of you, for your uh, incredibly in interesting comments and thoughts about this. Um, if we have just a couple of minutes, if anybody has any questions or comments, please just raise your hand, and our friend Jamie will come over and let you speak about it. Thanks for the panel, fantastic. Uh, quick question, I was hoping you could start off with Facebook and maybe you guys could jump in. Uh, pertaining to community standards and Facebook work, the, the, the work platform within Facebook, can you expand into those areas as it applies to the distribution and advertising and all these things going into play? Is there any way you can expand on that? And I was, I was kind of like curious about the opinions of the panel regarding that platform and Facebook work as well as how you use community standards to keep things in check. So, and, and when you say, are you talking specifically about the Facebook at work initiative? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, as, far as, a, as far as an advertising uh, a strategy or play within there, that right now with Facebook at work, we're just trying to explore the, at, at, at Facebook, let me start this way. At Facebook, we use Facebook a lot internally for work. In fact, that really, when I started there about six years ago, that really surprised me how much we used our internal tools. So that's something that we're testing out, and there are organizations that are using Facebook at work to see if that can be an effective communication and sharing tool within their organizations. That's not something that uh, we have a, a, a um, built-out advertising or mobile video strategy around. Uh, but in terms of community standards, and, and you know, we... We really pride ourselves in making sure that Facebook's a safe environment and making sure that the video content that gets pushed out there is, 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 uh, is, you know, meets the standards. Yeah, I would just say, you know, like privacy, like all these things, you know, are very hot topics. Um, you know, one thing we talk about is with mobile video. Uh, today on mobile video, if you look at the top 100 apps at a given moment, like they're always changing, they're always turning, whether you're on Android or what it, in whatever category, you know, we call it today's prime time, that you have audiences at scale that are bigger than some of the biggest TV audiences at that moment. And these are in, you know, premium apps that are used by, you know, millions of people on a, on a given daily basis. So um, it is, you know, it's, it's content that's, uh, you know, whether it's a game, whether it's an entertainment app or a social app, 
it is, you know, content that is, uh, you know, rich, and you don't have to, say, police it or have some of the concerns around adjacency or content because it is so, it is so premium, it is capturing, like, so much of consumers' time and spend. And it's actually a really good place to drive engagement for, for, for ads. Um, if you go about the long tail, you know, I think you can start talking about fraud and, and the long tail of, you know, mobile apps and, and, and web, you know, that's a whole nother story. Uh, but we really focus on, you know, curated kind of groups of, of time spent where, where users are, and that tends to be, you know, more premium kind of environments that are more favorable for, for brands and, and advertisers. Okay, we, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we only have time for one more question, and these two raise their hand at the same time, so you guys are going to have to throw scissors, paper, rock. Are you ready? <laughs> All right, ready? Here we go. Scissors, paper, rock. Oh, ah. scissor cuts paper. All right, here we go. Very good. <laughs> Thank you to the panel. That was awesome. Um, I'd just like to ask whether you, what your opinions are on AR and VR coming into the video space. Obviously, there's a huge amount of content now going from video from all the stats that are out there, but I'd be very interested to hear your opinion on whether AR and VR is, you know, with 5G coming, whether it's going to be a real big play for you guys. I, I'm personally, I'm amazed that AR, I've had the opportunity to see Magic Leap uh, down in Florida and what they're doing, and it's truly, truly remarkable, and I believe game-changing and really so far ahead of what else is going on in VR. Um, we at PBS have done several VR type things. We've done it with Frontline, Nature, et cetera. Um, I wouldn't be like betting the farm that that's gonna be the future of our content, but I do believe you have to create content for that platform. And I think with the success of Pokemon Go that we've seen recently, we've seen what happens when you combine mobile, a compelling MMO, massive multiplayer online game, um, AR in a compelling way that just takes off. So you, you're actually seeing what is really going to happen in AR, and not that that hasn't been around that technology a while, but this was the first time that all kind of came together. And so I think um, you know the future is very bright for AR and VR in a way, but especially AR. What's coming? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, how about a big hand for your moderator, Todd? And of course the panel. <laughs>